Now, having considered the anatomy and physiology of the fetal circulation prior to birth, we now want to think about this momentous event, this milestone in the human lifespan continuum, which is, which is birth. Now, at birth, the baby's going to start to breathe. So uh, pulmonary res respirations begin. And of course, these are the arteries. That's the right pulmonary artery. That's the left pulmonary artery. One taking blood to each lung. Now, as the lungs are oxygenated with gaseous oxygen from the air, the effect of that gaseous oxygen is to vasodilate the pulmonary arterial vasculature. So these arteries in their branches are going to dilate, especially the smaller branches, the arterioles in the lung are going to dilate so they can take maximum benefit of this oxygen and pick it up. That's why we have this reflex pulmonary arterial vasodilation as a result of the oxygen which is now entering the alveoli. So what this means is that more blood from the pulmonary trunk is going to go through the pulmonary arterial system and through the pulmonary vascular system. Absolutely brilliant because it now means the baby is getting rid of their own carbon dioxide, picking up their own oxygen. It's exactly what we want. But of course, once the blood has been through the lungs, it's going to come back to the left side of the heart. It's going to come back to the left atrium. And that's going to increase the pressure of the blood in the left atrium, which takes us to this diagram. So the pressure of the blood in the left atrium is now increasing. And we've seen that the foramen ovale is this flap-like structure. It's a valvular structure. It opens that way and it closes that way. And now the pressure in the left atrium is higher because of the blood coming back via the pulmonary veins because of the vasodilation in the pulmonary arterial system. So the increased pressure here is going to tend to close that flap, to close the foramen ovale, giving us a physiological closure and an intact atrial septum or a physiologically intact atrial septum for the first time in life. And as well as that, as we'll see later, there's also going to be constriction in the umbilical vein and construction, uh, constriction in the ductus veniosus. What's that going to mean for the amount of blood going into the inferior vena cava? Well, that's going to reduce the amount of blood going into the inferior vena cava. And of course, the inferior vena cava goes up, connects to the, the inferior vena cava here, going into the right atrium. So because there's less blood going through the umbilical vein and the ductus venosus, that means there's less blood going into the right atrium. And that means the pressure in the blood in the right atrium is going to reduce. So we have a combination of increasing pressure here and decreasing pressure here. And that's going to result in closure of this foramen of Ali. And as well as that effect, there's probably some constriction of the atrial septal muscle as well that uh, reduces the size of this hole. And in fact, physiologically, what happens is shortly after birth, the pressure in both atria actually becomes equalised. Therefore, the valvular foramen of Ali closes and later it will fuse. And actually, it's, it's only uh, fully obliterated at two weeks after birth in 3% of uh, neonates. And it's obliterated in 87% of infants at four months. So basically what we're looking at is this um, healing over, fusing in the first few months of life. But this physiological closure because of the valvular nature of the foramen of Ali occurring in the first minutes of life. Now, of course, there's other vessels to consider lower down. We've looked at the umbilical arteries and we've looked at the uh, umbilical vein. Now, when the baby is born, the umbilical cord is going to be exposed to the air. And bradykinins form in the blood of the umbilical cord in response to this lowered temperature. Now, the bradykinin, uh, the kinin polypeptides are uh, hormones. 
that control and relax smooth muscle. So when they affect the smooth muscle in the vasculature, they can cause vasodilation or vasoconstriction. And as well as that, as well as that, bradykinin is also formed by granular leukocytes in the lungs as a result of exposure to uh, gaseous oxygen. And that's going to come back into the circulation via the pulmonary veins. And these bradykinins that are stimulated by the arrival of oxygen in the lungs and the cooling of the umbilical cord have several effects. Firstly, these bradykinins will constrict the umbilical arteries and they will constrict the umbilical vein. And they will also have some effect in constricting the ductus arteriosus as well. And as well as that, the same bradykinins actually inhibit constriction of the pulmonary vessels. So the same bradykinin is going to constrict the umbilical arteries and the umbilical vein. It's going to constrict the ductus arteriosus, but they're going to dilate the pulmonary arterioles especially, meaning the blood supply to the lungs is ensured. So that brings us on to thinking about the ductus arteriosus now in, in a, little more, uh, a little more detail. Now, as we know, this in fetal life is shunting blood from the uh, pulmonary trunk to the uh, arch of the aorta up here. And this is good because in the fetal situation, it bypasses the fetal lungs. And in fetal life, the ductus arteriosus arises just by the bifurcation into the right and the left pulmonary arteries and it's only about 8 to 12 millimeters long so it's quite short really just 8 to 12 millimeters in length and it's very clever because it joins the aorta at an angle of about 30 to 35 degrees with a very elongated uh, opening and this means that the blood flow from the pulmonary artery flows smoothly into the systemic circulation with the aorta so we don't get turbulence in the fetal blood circulation. So very impressive arrangement of anatomy in the ductus arteriosus that facilitates physiological smooth uninterrupted blood flow. But of course in postnatal life we no longer want a patent ductus arteriosus. We need that to close off just out of interest actually the the ductus arteriosus uh, when it's full of blood is it, four to five millimeters in diameter and considering that the aorta is only uh, five to six millimeters in diameter we can see that a lot of blood is shunted away from the fetal pulmonary circulation into the into the fetal systemic circulation anyway we're thinking about what happens at birth now now the tunica media in the ductus arteriosus the middle layer of the, uh, the arterial vessel is largely smooth muscle. So the ductus arteriosus is short, but it's a muscular artery, not an elastic artery like the other ones. But of course, very important to keep it open in fetal life, probably kept op open in fetal life partly by the action of prostaglandins, but we need it shut shortly after birth. And the ductus arteriosus indeed starts to close pretty well immediately or immediately after birth it starts to close but there's actually a bit of blood flow for about a week so there is some blood flow in the ductus arteriosus for a, a, about a week after birth now if we think about the situation here the pressure is now going to be higher in the aorta so whereas in the fetus blood went from the pulmonary artery to the aorta in the first hours of life blood is going to go in the reverse direction from the aorta into the pulmonary circulation. And actually this is probably physiologically useful that some blood goes from the aorta into the pulmonary circulation in the first hours of life because that's going to increase the pulmonary circulation, it's going to increase the volume of the blood going into the pulmonary circulation which of course means that more oxygen can be picked up and more uh, carbon dioxide can be exhaled through the now neonatal lungs.
But this reverse blood flow that does occur from the aorta into the pulmonary artery in the first few hours of life is important because it probably inhibits the production of prostaglandins and that will allow further constriction of the ductus arteriosus because remember the prostaglandins are dilatory and we no longer want that. So the reverse blood flow probably inhibits the release of prostaglandins allowing that to start to close off. And in fact this reverse blood flow from the aorta back into the pulmonary artery has probably several effects. It's believed that the reverse blood flow will stimulate vasoconstricting factors in the endothelium of the ductus arteriosus which will also help that to constrict and to close off. And also the reverse of blood flow probably has some uh, release of catecholamine um, effects and it's known that there's adrenergic nerve receptors in the ductus arteriosus so that probably too helps it to constrict. And of course it's long been believed that the increase in oxygen as the baby starts to breathe, as the neonate now starts to breathe, is going to constrict the ductus arteriosus uh, as well. So there's several factors here resulting in the constriction of the ductus arteriosus. And there's actually two stages of closure that are described for the ductus arteriosus. The first stage closure um, is in the first 10 to 15 hours of life. First 10 to 15 hours. And that's caused by this smooth muscle uh, constriction, this vasoconstriction. And the second stage closure occurs in the uh, first two to three weeks of life. And that's probably mostly caused by proliferation of the uh, intima the inside layer of the uh, ductus arteriosus proliferates and fills up the lumen of the ductus arteriosus, causing a more permanent closure. So there we have the three main changes that occur shortly after birth. The constriction of the ductus arteriosus and the closure of the ductus arteriosus, the closure of the uh, foramen ovale, and the constriction of the uh, ductus veniosus uh, and we could add the constriction of the umbilical vein and the constriction of the umbilical arteries. Essential anatomical modifications all controlled by well-programmed physiological modifications stimulated by this amazing process of birth.